Hello, my name is Alex Arth, and in today's episode, we're going to be looking at Edwin of Northumbria, described by Bede as Rex Anglorum, King of the English. Hello, welcome back. So as I mentioned in the introduction, we're going to be looking at Edwin of Northumbria, who Bede describes as Rex Anglorum, or King of the English. And so this is going to be a very interesting episode to look at. And if you like Northumbrian history or Anglo-Saxon history, definitely subscribe now. There's plenty more to see. And I hope you'll join me on the rest of this adventure and story as we go on. So just behind me here, we have a very romantic Victorian depiction of Edwin. And as you can see in behind him, you've got York Minster, which he's famous for establishing and obviously the trappings of what they thought the Anglo-Saxons would have worn. He's got his sword in his hand, his shield, and a big red cloak with his brooch on his shoulder as well. And the crown, very much sort of like, as you'd imagine, a medieval king wearing. We're not entirely sure if they wore crowns at this point, but it's a very interesting one nevertheless. So we've mentioned Edwin in a previous episode, and that was in the Elfrith episode, where we talked about him as Elfrith's rival. So just to summarize, Elfrith is a young Elfing or prince of the Venetians. He then expands his kingdom through war and very, very successful wars as well, because the surrounding enemies around him who attack him get defeated, and then he has the space to expand his kingdom. It seems that either when he was in exile or when he was king of Venetia, he marries into the Darien royal house, Acca of the princess of Daria, Edwin's sister, and then from there, tensions grow with her family and then cause him to overtake the Darians and conquer them as a kingdom. When he conquers the Darians, then Edwin is forced into exile. So this is where we pick up Edwin's story. When Edwin is forced into exile, he tries to get as far away as possible from the, uh, the power of Elfrith. So he goes to Gwynedd, and Gwynedd seems like a good place to go. There's a buffer state right here at Powys, and it seems to be a good place because the kings of Powys will hold out against Northumbrian expansionism, whereas he is here in Gwynedd. He feels safe, but it doesn't seem to be a great location in the long run because the Northumbrians are able to put a power or dominion over the kingdom of Reged. And in around about a, uh, 612, 613 AD, um, Eildrith comes down and defeats a Welsh force around about here at the Battle of the Erva, or what we today would know as modern day Chester. When he defeats that Welsh force, and he defeats a force from the Kingdom of Powys, and we don't see any of the forces from the Kingdom of Gwynedd there, but it doesn't matter. Suddenly now Powys is defeated, and they're probably forced into some sort of vassal arrangement, or at least a, a form of tribute to the Northumbrians. So that means now Gwynedd is directly near a Northumbrian vassal or towards a, an area which has now got greater Northumbrian control. Because of that, he now needs to move again, and he moves into the kingdom of Mercia. Now, when he moves into the kingdom of Mercia, he marries the daughter of the king of Mercia, Quenberger. Now, when he marries Quenberger, he has two sons, Osfrith and Edfrith, and they um, he lives there for a while, and he seems to have a successful relationship and a successful sort of life within the Mercian kingdom. But again, Ilfric expands his dominion. And when he expands his dominion, he starts forcing into North Mercia and he seems to force the, the, the Mercian king into some sort of vassal agreement in the north part at least. So he takes over North Mercia. When he takes over North Mercia, now Mercia isn't safe anymore. And it's possible that his father-in-law is now being put under pressure to hand him over, to kill him, to murder him. And so Edwin flees again, and he ends up in the kingdom of the East Angles. Now, when he ends up in the kingdom of the East Angles, I mentioned in the previous episode that what happens is that Ragwal, king of East Anglia, he's put under threats, he's put under uh, bribes, he's put under all sorts of pressure, and he's about to capitulate to Athelflith. But he doesn't capitulate Athelflith. Instead, his wife reminds him of his duty uh, to his guest. And so because of this, he makes an alliance with Edwin. And Edwin probably had some form of retinue that he picked up, combined probably of Welsh forces, Mercian forces, um, Venetians who had been forced out of their kingdom, Darians who had been forced out of their kingdom, you know, the normal sort of people who would band around the early Northumbrian 
or any Anglo-Saxon king or, or king in the British Isles at this period. And so they make an agreement and his war band plus the army of the East Angles under Ragwald then attacks and defeats Aelfrith uh, um, at the Battle of the Idol. And when they battle, kill him at the Battle of Idol, and Aelfrith becomes king of what we'd understand as the northern part of England. He's able to expand his territory and he brings uh, Lindsay, uh, this area here under his control. And alongside this later on within his reign, he is able also to bring Elmet under. So Elmet and Lindsay are now brought into Northumbria. And alongside this as well, the Isle of Man is also brought under his influence as well. So when we see this sort of expansion, he is now the powerful king up here. And so he then is able to influence control over these areas. The interesting thing is, is that it seems he doesn't have influence as much on, over the kingdom of Dalatia, which previously Athelthrift did. So it seems that that is now out of his control because the kingdom of Alclut or the kingdom of the Dumbarton Britons, um, this area here becomes a buffer state that therefore means he is unable to get to his uh, nephews and to his sister who flee up here. So there's a little bit of the political thing there. Edwin, even though he comes across as a more righteous king than Aelfrith, probably would have still killed Aelfrith's children. So the eight children of Aelfrith have to flee and they go up to the kingdom of Dalatia. So Edwin puts aside his previous marriage with Quenberger and now he's looking for a new marriage. And when he's looking for a new marriage, he needs a powerful alliance, something that not only will give him legitimacy, but also power as well. And so because of this, he then looks to the kingdom of Kent and he look, talks to Athelbert of Kent, who is married to Queen Bertha. Now, Queen Bertha is the daughter of the King of Francia. And so Kent is within the sphere of what we'd understand as early medieval France. So because of that, he then marries his daughter, Athelbert. And Athelbert comes up to Northumbria and marries Edwin. And Edwin is never described as a pagan, whereas Ethelfrith was. So there's an interesting one. We also have a reference of him being baptized by the grandson of Urin of Regent. So Urin of Regent's grandson ended up in Gwened and he baptized Edwin. So he was a Celtic Christian. When he was a Celtic Christian, he was then practicing, maybe not to the greatest extent, but he was at least a Christian nominally which was important for you know, historians like Bede and other people like that. So he may have still followed some of the Germanic faith, or he may have just been a pure Christian and still followed the Christian faith, but maybe just to a lesser extent than some of them would have liked. Nevertheless, to someone like Bede, who is a, de a dedicated Catholic, a Celtic Christian still wasn't enough. And so because of that, when he marries into the kingdom of Kent, Ethelbert also brings up with her her priest Paulinus. And Paulinus explains the Christian faith, or at least the Catholic faith, to Edwin over the course of his life. And after a failed assassination attempt on the feast celebrating the birth of his daughter, Edwin converts to Christianity. And they go up to Ad Gefrin, which I've done a video series on, by the way, so you can watch those and you can see about the Anglo-Saxon capital of um, Ad Gefrin up here in Venetia. And um, he goes up to Ad Gefrin and in the River Glen, 3,000 of his kingdom are baptized into the Catholic faith. Now, it would have seemed that Edwin would have continued and continued to expand his power and become this great, powerful king of the English in northern England and southern Scotland. But there is a big problem for him because his stepbrother, Cadwalla, king of Gwened, is jealous of him. Now, we don't know exactly why he's jealous, but he makes an alliance with the king of Mercia, Pender, who is a new king of Mercia. When he makes an alliance with him, they come up and they attack and they kill Edwin in battle. So it's two years of fire and death that then put onto the Northumbrians. And in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, it says it was so bad that no history was recorded in this time because so much death and horror was put upon the Northumbrians. So that's a bit about Edwin. If you'd like to see more about him, obviously I said there's an entire episode about Edwin and Paulinus within my uh, Ad Geffren series, which you can watch uh, just up here. But alongside this as well, I really hope you've enjoyed the episode and you've learned a little bit more about Northumbrian history and this King Edwin. If you would like to know more, please join us for another video soon. But in the meantime, please do like and subscribe. 
If you'd like to support me financially, I do have a Patreon, which you can find in the description below. And I also offer guided tours. So if you'd like a guided tour, you can book one with me as well, right up here in the northeast of England on my website, www.islestours.co.uk. And the link is in the description as well. In the meantime, though, stay safe and well. And I hope you'll join me for another video in the near future. Thank you very much.